Mark chapter 8, we'll read it in its entirety this morning. In those days when there was again a large crowd and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on their way. And some of them have come from a great distance. And his disciples answered him, where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? And he was asking them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground and taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them and started giving them to his disciples to serve to them. And they served them to the people. They also had a few small fish. And after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. And they ate and were satisfied. And they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. About 4,000 were there, and he sent them away. And immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, what is this generation, pardon, why does this generation seek for a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. And they had forgotten to take bread and did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. And he was giving orders to them, saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up, they said to him, 12. When I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they said to him, seven. And he was saying to them, do you not yet understand? And they came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to Jesus and implored him to touch him. Taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, for I see them like trees walking around. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes and looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? They told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. 
Imagine with me, if you can, a reality TV show about catering. Large events, lots of people, lots of food. Think in terms, for those of you who have seen the show, Chopped, where you have a very narrow selection of what you can choose to make your meal with. Imagine that you really enjoy watching this weekly show. I don't really enjoy watching anything, so that's why I'm saying imagine. Maybe it's not hard for you. Imagine that you really like watching this show. The, the, spectac- the spectacular places that they go to, the creative foods, the unique preparations, the diverse serving styles, the massive cleanup job afterwards. We could go on and on. Now imagine this week, you've planned your schedule, you're sitting down, ready for this week's brand new episode, ready to see the amazing wonder of a chef catering for a crowd, creating the menu, cooking and preparing the food, serving it to the masses. As the start time time nears, there's a teaser, a trailer of sorts, that's meant to whet your appetite for tonight's program. But something seems very similar to a previous week's show. I mean, very similar. Similar place, similar food, similar details. That's basically where we find ourselves this morning. You may have noticed that in the reading of Mark 8. You may have had those thoughts. Like, didn't we just talk about feeding a multitude? Yes, we did. At the end of chapter 6. So why the repetition? Why does... Mark include it here in his account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, for one, many of the miracles that Jesus did happened very often. He ministered for three years. He wasn't some sort of one-shot wonder miracle worker. Each time that he desired to show mercy and pity, on people or a person, he did. He wasn't waiting for Matthew, Mark, and John to be around so that he could do something in their presence so that they could record it later. He lived his life serving people, teaching and healing. And the gospel writers, having lived alongside him and ministered alongside him, determined what to include and where to include it, in what order to include it in. Now, critics of the Bible, of the New Testament, of Christianity as a whole, make the accusation that the repetition of the feeding of the multitude is proof of fabrication. See, they're just making it up. He had nothing else to say, so he just talked about a previous miracle and made it look like Jesus did the same thing again. However, if that's the case... If that's all that's happening, if it's mere repetition, it would certainly match the numeric details. It's an oral culture. They didn't didn't pass things along in an oral culture like the telephone game where you whisper something in someone's ear and it goes all the way around the room and you see what comes out on the other end. That's not the way the gospel came to us. In fact, there are six recorded accounts of Jesus feeding a multitude throughout the Gospels. Matthew records two. Mark records two. This is the second one we've looked at. Luke records one, and John records one. As I mentioned, Jesus was not a one-and-done miracle worker. He ministered for three years, day in and day out. Now, with that said, there are a lot of similarities between the feeding of, five, the, feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 6 and the feeding of the 4,000 in chapter 8. In both accounts, Jesus has compassion on the crowd. In both accounts, the location is a desolate place. In both accounts, 
The same question comes from the disciples. How do we feed this large crowd in such a desolate place? Jesus asked the disciples the same question in both accounts. How many loaves do you have? In both accounts, the multitude is ordered to have a seat on the ground. In both accounts, thanks to God, the Father is offered and bread is broken and distributed and multiplied in both accounts. In both accounts, fish along with bread is provided. In both accounts, the entire crowd was satisfied, full, as a result of what was provided. In both accounts, leftovers were gathered. So why the recorded repetition of similar stories or similar miracles? Because God, the Holy Spirit, determined that we needed the repetition to help us remember, to help us understand. We can see that play out even in the conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. He's asking them, when they're worried about food again, do you not remember? We are, unfortunately, a very forgetful people, spiritually forgetful. But we're not the first generation of God's people to deal with spiritual amnesia and spiritual confusion. We can go all the way back to the Old Testament. There are lots of examples. I'll note a couple. Judges 8, the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. That's quite a rescue. Doesn't that sound like something that you would remember? He delivered them from the hands of their enemies on every side. There was no hope for them. They were as good as done, finished, and yet God saves them and rescues them. And what is the commentary that's recorded? They did not remember the Lord their God. Or Jeremiah, all throughout Jeremiah, my people have forgotten me in chapter 2. They have forgotten me days without number, Jeremiah records for us. They have forgotten the Lord their God, chapter 3. God says to them, you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. My people have forgotten me. They burn incense to worthless gods. They've stumbled from their ways, from the ancient paths, to walk in bypaths, not on a highway, to make their land a desolation. Or in chapter 5 that we heard read earlier in the service, they know the way of the Lord and the ordinance of their God, but they too with one accord have broken the yoke and burst the bonds. Therefore, a lion from the forest will slay them and a wolf of the deserts will destroy them. A leopard is watching their cities. Everyone who goes out of them will be torn in pieces because their transgressions are many. Their apostasies are numerous. Spiritual forgetfulness is real. It's also common and it's also deadly. That's why God's Word gives so much emphasis on calling us to remember. The answer to our spiritual forgetfulness and our proneness to poor understanding is clear. We must remember. We must seek to understand. And spiritual forgetfulness and lack of understanding or spiritual misunderstanding go hand in hand. Look at verse 17 and 21 here in Mark chapter 8. Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? There's there's a connection here. Us remembering the truth about who God is and what he's done for us is closely tied to us understanding him and our purpose in life and what he's done for us. There's some variance of the word or concept of remembering used over 500 times in the scriptures. That's not because repetition is fun. It's because repetition is necessary for people like us that are prone to spiritual forgetfulness. 
The solution to spiritual amnesia is not a secret. It's not even that complex. Unfortunately, unfortunately simple doesn't always equal easy. Forgetfulness is a great enemy to a joyful and faithful Christian life. We must not underestimate our need, constant need, for encouragement to remember Christ. And we must not neglect the means that he himself has given us to do so. Listen as Peter writes in the first century, Therefore I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right, as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside, that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind. Just a few short verses, one statement there. Peter says, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. Peter knows by experience in his own life and watching others around him that he's prone to forget, that he's prone to stray from the truth because of spiritual forgetfulness. And so when he writes to these original recipients, and thus to us as well, he says, I'll always be, able, be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. Even though you are established in this truth, even though this truth is in you, it is right, Peter says, as long as I am living, I will stir you up by way of reminder. And it's almost like Peter knew that he was writing scripture that we would be reading because he says, I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you'll be able to call these things to mind. Peter's dead now. Did you know that? He's still reminding us this morning as we read this passage that though we already know the truth, though we are established in the truth, though the truth is in us, we need to be reminded. We see that evidenced by Jesus feeding a multitude again. We see that evidenced by Mark recording it here, probably at Peter's side, recording it here again for us. This spiritual forgetfulness, forgetting the deliverances of God, forgetting the provision of God in our lives is dangerous for us. Think about the people of Israel of old. Right on the heels of unthinkable miracles, with their pockets full of Egyptian gold, grumbling at their less than five star accommodations in the desert. We want to go back. Everything was so good. If you're familiar with the early pages of Exodus, everything didn't seem to be all that good. It seemed like they were making a lot of bricks. And it was getting increasingly difficult to make those bricks. But all of a sudden, when they're rescued from Pharaoh in Egypt, they're remembering wrongly. Things that were miserable, they're remem re remembering that they were good. And all the saving that, and rescuing that God had done for them doesn't seem to be anywhere on their mind. Grumbling and complaining about the present is a result of forgetting the truth of the past. It's faithlessness at the end of the day. So what then is the remedy? Repetition and reminders. Listen as the apostle writes to the church at Philippi. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. That's Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Then in chapter 4, verse 4, to write the same things again, is no trouble to me, Paul says, and it's a safeguard to you. Repetition should be no trouble. And it's actually good for us to be reminded. And so he says it again, rejoice in the Lord always. And if that repetition isn't enough, he goes further and says, again, I will say rejoice. 
We saw it this morning in Psalm 146, bookends. The repetition, offering praise to God. Repetition and reminders are the remedy for spiritual forgetfulness and spiritual misunderstanding. We must guard ourselves from this spiritual forgetfulness. We must root out those things that threaten our joy and threaten our faith. The remedy is to remember, to remember God's gracious deliverance and redemption, to establish it in our memory, to memorialize it. We learn through repetition. From the very beginning, that's how we learn anything. We hear something over and over. There's a reason why all those 80s songs are stuck in my head. It's not because I worked hard listening to them. Exodus 13, Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt from the house of slavery, for by a powerful hand of the Lord brought you out from this place, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. He continues in verse 9, And it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth, for with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Moses is encouraging the people to set up reminders. Remind yourself. Or in Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy is literally the second giving of the law. That's what it means. God thought it was so important to repeat the law, he gives us another book that is full of his law. You shall well remember, chapter 7, verse 18. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all of Egypt. Remember your rescue. Now, it's really not all that important. It's helpful for you to know, but it's not all that important for you to remember all the details about how Israel was rescued from the Egyptians. But you know what is important? For you to remember how God rescued you from your sin. How he rescued you from that foul bondage that would have carried you all the way to hell and kept you there forever and ever. It's really important that we remember that. Deuteronomy 4.9, only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life but make them known to your sons and grandsons. You know, one of the ways that we remember what God has done to us, we tell others what God has done for us. That's exactly what Deuteronomy 4.9 is expressing. Don't forget, don't depart, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. The best way that we serve the next generation, not just in our homes, definitely in our homes, but not just in our homes, but throughout the culture, is by transmitting truth to them. We've just begun doing that as a church in the past couple weeks, which we can probably take some time right now and prove how good repetition works. Children, are you listening? Who made you? Children, are you listening? (laughs) Who made you? What else did God make? Why did God make you and all things? For his own glory. Let's try the first question again. I'm a little confused why there are so few kids speaking up. Who made you? That's better. <laughs> Three weeks ago, if we asked that question, eh, there would have been some who have been working on the catechisms. But the the repetition from the past two weeks, it's how we learn. It's how we remember. Again, Deuteronomy 8, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. You catch that? How do you not forget him? by keeping his commandments and his ordinances. Verse 18, but you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. It shall come about if you ever forget 
the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you that you will surely perish. Remembering God and remembering his gospel and remembering the rescue that he has accomplished in our lives is an issue of life and death. The Passover was given to the people of God as a vivid, perpetual reminder of God's redemptive acts. And then Jesus alters the Passover, instituting the Lord's Supper and communion for the same reason. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. On the first Sunday of each month, the reason that we come to the table is because we're commanded to remember what Christ has done. Do this in remembrance of me. Is it not surprising and at the same time amazing that we need to be reminded of the sacrificial death of our Savior? Now, it, it's not that it's something that we don't remember the facts about. But knowing those facts of what God has done for us in Christ doesn't always result in the way that we're living. And that's the emphasis of the reminder here. Remember it to the degree that it affects every fiber of your being. What a commentary on the power of remaining sin residing within us. That Jesus said, keep on doing this in remembrance of me. Don't forget who I am and what I've done for you. What a testimony to the subtle strategies of the devil and the alluring deceptions of the world. That we're commanded to do this in remembrance of him. I mean, it seems inconceivable that a people who have been rescued from the wrath of God and granted eternal salvation would ever forget the one who at such cost brought it about. Yet that is exactly our tendency. We are forgetful. May it not be said of us, as it is said of the disciples here at the end of chapter 8, do you not yet understand? So, while this recorded miracle is very similar to the previous account, there are still lessons to be learned for us. There are aspects of Jesus that are on display in this account that we might know Him and worship Him. We've talked before about some of the miracles. It's important for us not to sentimentalize these stories and also important for us not just to be wowed at the number of people and the small amount of food, but recognize what's actually going on. And that's helpful in considering this one, especially with the context. The disciples that have been traveling with Jesus as he ministers, they have seen him settle the stormy seas and calm the swirling winds and heal the crazed demoniac and cured the woman with the 12-year issue of blood and raising Jairus's daughter and watching him face the dishonor from his family and his friends. They themselves have received training from him and been sent out. They were there when he fed the 5,000. They watched him cast the demon from the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. They witnessed the healing of the deaf and the mute man. And chapter 8 begins, in those days when there was again a large crowd and we're on the edge of our seats. What's going to happen this time? He calls his disciples and says, I feel compassion for the people. The compassionate Christ, which is point number one, the compassionate Christ. Yet again, Jesus shows compassion. Compassion is the most common emotional state that is used to describe Jesus on the pages of the New Testament. As we've walked through Mark and seen how he's interacted with people, have you tired of his compassion? Again and again, he's compassionate. He feels compassion for their hunger. He feels compassion for the way that they've been injured by others. He feels compassion for their weariness, compassion for their lostness. He feels compassion for diseases and infirmities. He feels compassion for those who are dealing with afflictions, those who are possessed by demons, those with incurable diseases. He feels compassion on those with chronic ailments 
and those with grief and sorrow. He feels compassion on the poor. He feels compassion on those who fight bitter memories. He feels compassion on those who are struggling with political oppression. He feels compassion on those who are suffering religious oppression, the Pharisees here in our chapter. He feels compassion in light of their own sin and guilt. And in his compassion, we find him again teaching his disciples and teaching us to look to him for absolutely everything, even the impossible, or especially the impossible. In his compassion, he's displaying his his might to create. He didn't need a ready-made box of just add water to create this bread. But he asked, what, how many loaves do you have? He desires to involve us as he displays his might and his power to the world around us. He encourages us by showing that he can use whatever we have. One of the benefits of seeing two different accounts here, Jesus begins with something different each time. Because the point's not what he began with. The point is the miracle and what he accomplished through it, no matter how small or insignificant, God can use it. Christ reveals his might. Also in his compassion, he is showing his commitment to provide for his people. His compassion results in him feeding the multitude. He's committed to not just recognizing the need, but fulfilling it. What about us with regard to that? Do do we talk about caring, or do we really seek to alleviate the burdens of those that we say we care about? Jesus displays for us here. He doesn't just say, I feel really bad for them. He goes another step and does what is necessary to provide for them and to help them. In his compassion, he reveals his strategy or the means by which he desires to reach the world. This is, based on the geographical location, a Gentile crowd. Jesus fed 5,000 Jews basically before. These are Gentiles. These aren't his people. Do you sometimes question in passages like this, the compassion that Jesus has for the lost. I think we can understand in some measure the compassion that he would have for his own people, for those who show him honor and seek to do his will. But Jesus has compassion for the lost. The word that he uses here, this is the only time that Jesus himself says, I feel compassion. The other gospel writers note the compassion that he feels at times. But here Jesus himself is saying, I feel compassion. I feel it deep down in the pit of my stomach. I hurt and long to grant these people what they need. Do we feel that kind of compassion for the lost? For the hurting? Jesus performs a miracle here that the lost benefit from primarily. We're benefiting from it here this morning, but initially it was lost Gentiles who were benefiting from the compassion of Christ. Jesus cares about the material and the physical. It bothered him that their stomachs were empty and they had a long way to go home. He cares about the material and the physical, and so should we, meeting the needs not only of God's people, but also of the world around us. We see it in Jesus displayed, meeting the needs not only of the Jews, but also of the Gentiles, the religious and the irreligious. He feeds them all. He provides food for them all, the evil and the good, the just and the unrighteous. The compassion of Christ, point one. Point two, picking up in verse four, comparing and contrasting Verses 4 through 10 give us basically the account of the feeding. 
So there, there are different details, as, as I mentioned earlier, actually before I mentioned all of the similarities, but there are different details that are worth noting here as well. There are 4,000 that are fed in this story, and it was 5,000 previously. This story, they have seven loaves. Previously, there were just five. Just two fish versus, in this account, it's a few fish. Twelve baskets earlier and now seven baskets. It's actually more leftovers this time. There's a different word used for baskets. Even if you look down in 19 and 20, when Jesus himself is referring to each of these accounts, which also is, is a wonderful note with regard to those who would say it's just a repeti- just repetition, Mark repeating the same story again, Jesus clearly refers to two different accounts here. Do you remember, he says, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? You remember how many broken pieces, how many baskets full of broken pieces you picked up? That word for baskets... It's like a lunch pouch size. Think of a a leather bag, leather leather lunch box. Food for one, maybe two. That's what they picked up the first time. But when Jesus continues, verse 20, do you remember when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000? How many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? Is that large baskets? You can see it a little bit in the English language, but In the original, it's clear. It's not that lunch pouch size. It's a completely different word. It's more like a bushel basket. So seven hamper-like bushel baskets of food are left over, which is remarkable. So there are different details here. And then couched in verse 6 there. Jesus directed the people to sit down on the ground Taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them and started giving them to his disciples and served to them, and they served them to the people. So if you want to know exactly how the miracle happened, it's right there, really clear in verse 6. And when you find it, let me know. (laughs) Because that's where it happens, but it doesn't say. He gave thanks, he broke it, and it multiplied. That's where the miracle happens. And they also had a few small fish, verse 7. Here's another evidence that it's a Gentile crowd because Jews would have only given thanks once. But Jesus, again, with a Gentile crowd, takes the opportunity to let them know where this provision is coming from. And he give thanks, gives thanks again. Jesus creating something from nothing. We looked at this previously with the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus creating a mature earth in, in the beginning. We see it happening on small scale here, creating mature bread, mature fish. Not a seed or a stalk or a head or the flour or the dough. Not even raw dough, but baked precisely, perfectly, just right. Not dense from being underbaked or burnt from being overbaked. He just created loaves. And they had a few fish. But they fed 4,000 with a few fish. They didn't provide fish eggs that needed to grow and develop. These weren't fish that were caught by line or by net. One old writer said it this way, the fish were created dead. Wrap your mind around that. But not spoiled. Prepped and ready to consume. He created it like that. Perfect. Ready to eat loaves and fish. And they ate. Verse 8, they, 4,000, ate and were satisfied. And they, the disciples, picked up seven baskets full of what was left over the broken pieces. About 4,000 were there. Here's a point that I think is worth us taking home. There's always enough grace to go around. Always. There is abundant mercy. And there are leftovers. You can get full, and when you are full of all the blessings of God... You haven't depleted his mercy and his grace and his love one bit. Continuing in verse 11, quelling curiosity. 11 through 13. Point next. I forgot what point it is, but it's point next. The Pharisees came out. They see what's happening. You know, these guys, they always have a problem. 
They begin arguing with Jesus. <laughs> Terrible idea to argue with God, but we're all prone to do it, I suppose. Seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. They've seen signs. What they're asking for here not is a sign like a miracle. You may think, well, he just did a miracle. Is that not a sign? That's not what they're asking for. What they're asking for, they're saying, let's see God, their God in their mind, a vague reference to the Father. Let's see him prove or put his stamp of approval on it. They're testing Jesus. Okay, is the Father going to put his, is he going to give us a sign putting his stamp of approval on this? Jesus sighs deeply. Why? Why do you seek for a sign? Why is this generation, why don't they believe? <coughs> Truly I say to you, Jesus says, no sign will be given to this generation. You're not going to get one. You're not going to get what you're looking for. You don't get to make the demands in the same way we don't get to make the demands on God. And look at verse 13, leaving them. He didn't hang around to try to convince them otherwise. He just left them. He didn't, he didn't satisfy their curiosity. And if you're pursuing Christ just with mere curiosity, be careful because you may be at risk of him leaving. If you're refusing to listen to the truth of, God, of the gospel, if you're reluctant to respond to the truth of the gospel, be careful. Are you listening to his compassionate call? We're all in that crowd that Jesus has compassion on. We all qualify as recipients of his grace and his mercy. Have you responded to that compassionate call in faith and in repentance, trusting him and turning from your sin? He will not satisfy mere curiosity, but he will satisfy your soul if you'll trust in him. And last point, questioning the disciples. Verses 14 through 21. We've looked at bits and pieces of this along the way. So the disciples forgot to take bread on the boat when they leave to go somewhere else. They had one loaf, not more than one loaf, maybe not a whole loaf in the boat with them. And Jesus is giving orders to them. Jesus is teaching them. Evidently, it's not dinner time, but they're worried about food. Watch out, he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. The disciples are reminded, leaven, he said, we don't have enough bread to eat. Jesus recognizing their dumb concern, said to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves and you picked up baskets of leftovers, do you not remember when I broke the seven loaves and you picked up baskets of leftovers? Do you not yet understand? They had forgotten to take bread. Jesus is giving them orders saying, watch out, beware. Jesus is teaching them spiritual truths. We know he cares about how much bread they have with them because he has cared about the multitudes having something to eat. But he doesn't care that they are so concerned about it. He cares that they're not concerned about the spiritual realities that are knocking at their door, the dangers that are knocking at their door, the leaven of the Pharisees spreading into them and them being affected by that, the leaven of Herod, Herod being, them being affected by that as it spreads into them. Jesus says, watch out, beware of that. And they're like, what are we going to eat for lunch? And so he says, you don't understand, do you? I mean, you, you have eyes and you've seen, you have ears and you've heard. Do you not remember? I mean, this, is, this is days ago. Weeks at most. Do you not remember? Like, to be concerned about those things makes zero sense for the disciples at this point. 
But oh, can't you imagine yourself just sitting right in there with the disciples? Yeah, what are we going to eat? And I mean, we, we've got bread, but like, we don't have any fish. I mean, they're sailing. It couldn't have been that difficult to come up with a fish to start with, even if Jesus needed that. Note the argument that Jesus makes here. It's not necessarily, do you remember me multiplying and feeding? Look again at 19 and 20. Do you remember when I broke the five loaves? Do you remember how many broken pieces you picked up? He's not asking, do you remember what I did? Do you remember the multiplying? Do you remember the feeding? Do you remember passing it out yourselves? But he says, do you not remember collecting the leftovers? Now, again, think with me. You want cleanup duty for a 4,000, 5,000 person picnic? <laughs> how is it not memorable? How, do, how are they not just as amazed gathering the leftovers as they were distributing the, the food in the first time, in the first place? Which is why Jesus says, do you not yet understand? But, but there's hope. He's not writing them off. He's not leaving them like the Pharisees. It's not yet. He's still patient, still compassionate with them and with every one of us. Because we're slow to understand and we're quick to forget. This is why a similar miracle is repeated from Peter to Mark, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Because we are too often slow on the uptake. Because we don't always learn the lessons the first time we're taught them. Because we do too often forget God's kindnesses toward us. In fact, this is why we sin. We forget the wickedness of our sin and what it cost our Savior to redeem us from it. This is why we complain and grumble. Because we forget the greatness of incomparable worth of all that is ours in Jesus Christ. It's why we're slow to forgive one another because we forget that God in Christ has forgiven us. It's why we get depressed and lose hope and become joyless and settle into spiritual mediocrity because we forget Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, and that he's conquered every one of our enemies and given us a sure future in heaven. Because we're inclined to grumble and be thankless and to complain about our circumstances, God graciously reminds us that we must remember his merciful redemption toward us and his continued provision for us. And he does so wonderfully so, wonderfully well here in the feeding of the 4,000. The antidote or remedy to spiritual amnesia is making every effort to recall and remember God's gracious deliverance from our sin and from hell. The fact that you, if you're in Christ, a sinner who was an enemy of God, are now a beloved child, is a miracle that is far, far more amazing than the feeding of the 4,000. May the wonder of that reality, that God has rescued us and made us his own, never fade. May that memory never fade in order that it may never be said of us, do you not yet understand? May God help us to understand and help us to remember who he is and what he's done for us in Jesus. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we pray that you'll take the truth of your word and bring about eternal, eternally significant consequences in our lives. Though we might be increasingly prone to remember the gospel and the gospel applied to us, that we might be all the more frequent in sharing it, in talking about it, and proclaiming it. With our mouths, with our choices, with our lives, God, you and you alone are worthy of worship and honor and glory, both now and forever. We pray that you will use our lives as seemingly insignificant as a few loaves and a few fish 
that we might be broken before you in order that we might be used by you to proclaim your truth, your kindness, and your compassion to a lost world around us. In Christ's name, amen.